told you about the battle of Horseshoe Bend. What I didn't tell you yesterday, that I'll start with today, is that the battle lasted about five hours. And after five hours of fighting, and the result that I gave you yesterday, one Lone Stick Indian entered General Andrew Jackson's camp. So following the five-hour battle, one lone Red Stick Indian entered Jackson's camp. Anybody know who that was? William Weatherford, yes. And what he did is he offered Jackson a peace offering, which was a slain buck deer. In other words, he was offering that to Jackson in return for him accepting surrender. Does that make sense? So following the five-hour battle, one lone Red Stick Indian entered General Andrew Jackson's camp and he offered a peace offering of a slain buck deer. Who was that? William Weatherford himself. Now, when he comes into camp, a lot of the soldiers, militia that were under Jackson, thought Jackson should kill him and maybe would have killed him themselves if not stopped. But Jackson wanted to hear what Weatherford had to say, how humble he might be and surrender. I don't know. But what Weatherford did is he informed General Jackson, if I had 800 more men, we would still be out there fighting. How do you think Jackson took that, Carter? Most people say not well. Actually, he admired his courage and his leadership to have the guts, so to speak, to come in and say that if I had 800 more men, we would still be fighting. So rather than <clears throat> humiliate him, he honored him in defeat. They shared a drink of some kind. They visited for a while. Jackson accepted the peace offering of William Weatherford and allowed him to leave unharmed. So William Weatherford comes in, he informs General Jackson if I had 800 men would still be fighting. He took that as a symbol of courage and leadership, sat him down, had a drink with him, visited for a little while, accepted the peace offering of the slain buck deer, and allowed Weatherford to leave unharmed. <clears throat> Well, after that particular battle, on August 9th of 1814, the United States government and the Indian tribes that were located in the southeastern part of the United States signed a treaty called the Treaty of Fort Jackson. On August 9th of 1814, the United States government and Indian tribes that were located in the northeastern part of the United States, that would be present-day Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi, they all signed a treaty. It was the first of many treaties in which the federal government would totally rip off Native Americans. First of many that we would rip off Native Americans. This treaty gave the United States of America 23 million acres of Native American land. And you know what they got in return? Nothing, basically. Nothing. The fact that we will leave you alone, more like. You know what I mean? But it's no longer your land, it's our land. Now when Jackson becomes president, he will change that philosophy, again, not to the betterment of Native Americans. So this treaty of Fort Jackson simply gave 23 million acres of land in both Georgia and present-day Alabama to the federal government in return for basically nothing. Now, these Creek Indians, right, and these Choctaw Indians, right, that fought for Jackson at Horseshoe Bend, they even took their lands. Those that thought they would fight for Jackson in hopes that he would treat them better, right, didn't. Part of those 23 million acres of land that he took in present-day Alabama and Georgia were their lands. So there's only one area in that southeastern part of the United States that needs to be defeated from an Indian perspective. What would that area be? 
What's the only air? What? Florida. Florida. And we don't own Florida. It's Spanish owned, but they don't have much of a grip on it. And who are inhabiting mainly most of Florida? Who are inhabiting there? Seminole Indians. So Jackson sets his sights on defeating the Seminole Indians next in Florida because he, what he wants to do is run the Seminoles out of Florida and then take that land over from Spain and make it a territory which will eventually become a state. That was his goal. So in 1817, General Jackson continues his assault of Indians, this time the Seminole Indians of Florida. And Jackson uh, basically ran his own private war against the Seminoles. Who did he have permission from to do that? Who did he ask permission to go into Florida and wipe, you know, clean out the Seminoles? Who gave him that permission to do that? The highest level, President Monroe. President James Monroe gave Jackson unlimited permission to go into Spanish Florida and clean the Seminole Indians out of there with the goal of claiming that area for the United States of America. So when he got that permission from President Monroe, he basically engaged the Seminoles in his own private little war. Well, after a little bit of fighting, Jackson and his men are victorious over the Seminoles. And after his victory, President Monroe appoints Jackson to be temporary governor of the Florida Territory. So after his victory over the Seminoles, President Monroe appoints Andrew Jackson temporary governor of Florida. Why would he do that? Jordy, why would he want a temporary governor there? What, what would Monroe want Jackson to do when he got there as temporary governor? What's the first thing he do? Develop a, a brand new territory. It has no what? What? It has no, well, what, but in general, what's that umbrella? It has no government. So Jackson's job was to create a government, a territorial government, in Florida. And it took him 11 months to do that. So Jackson served as temporary governor of Florida for 11 months. And once he established that territorial government, Tatum, what did he do, do you think? He's kind of done this every time he's done something. What did he do after he got done with the territorial government? Yeah, and he went where? He went back to his plantation in Tennessee, right? So that seems like what it, he does every time he does something, he ends up eventually back on the plantation, right? So after establishing this federal, or this territorial government in Tennessee, he goes back to his plantation. Now, to be honest with you, he wasn't in very good health from this point in his life on. He was 55 years old at this point, and his health wasn't that great at all. And he considered retirement. But what did he do instead? Anybody know? Come on. He went into, well not yet, good. He went into politics, okay? And the reason he went into politics wasn't because he liked them, he actually he despised them. He hated politicians, although he ends up being one. The point being is he saw so much corruption in his mind, in the national government, that he wanted to become a politician to try to fix it. And you're right, Maddie, he's going to set his sights on the presidency because he wants to clear up all this, what he sees as corruption. The ironic thing about Andrew Jackson, kids, is he hated politicians, but he was one of them. Okay? And he was one of them because of his feelings. Before we get to the hard-fought elections that he goes through, he's going to be very disappointed in one and then victorious in the other. I want to show you these videos on Andrew Jackson up to the point of what we've talked about so far. Now, I want you to really pay attention to your notes because this is an open note test and anything on these videos is fair game. Okay? Although 99%, well, not 95% of it you've gotten through the lecture. But if I want to throw something off there, I have the right to do that. So let's keep that in mind.